Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Caitlin and I upload all forms of true crime, education, psychology related content on this channel and if you don't already know, I do have a second channel where I upload all of the like beauty, fashion, lifestyle content that I used to upload on this channel as well. Um, but it's all over there so if you want to see some more content from me then definitely head on over there. I will leave the link in the description to that channel but it is just Caitlin Rose vlogs on YouTube if you do want to go and check it out. So today I'm back with another case and this one is unsolved and it is a strange one. Um, I mean, I pretty much say that in every video. So for today's video, we're going to be discussing the mysterious case of Chad Mora. I apologise if I mispronounced that, but before we get started, I am just going to zoom through the usual disclaimer that I like to include at the start of all my videos, where I just let you guys know that I'm not an expert. I'm not claiming to be an expert in this case or any of the other cases that I cover over on my channel. I'm simply working with information that I research myself through certain sources on the internet. And because only certain sources are accessible to me, it means I may get things wrong, leave things out, or mispronounce things and I apologise if I do any of those things. I'm not trying to cause anyone any harm or any injustice, I'm just simply working with the information that I have available to me. So with all that being said, we shall just go ahead and get started discussing the case of Chad Mora. Chad Lee Mora was born on the 11th of May in the year of 1971 in a place called Madison, Dane County in Wisconsin. By the time that Chad's case had taken place, he was a good looking and particularly in shape, young blonde 19 year old boy who spent his time uh, working in a bike shop in his hometown of Madison. He was popular and a particularly gifted athlete and was known by many as having a love for his car which was a yellow 1968 Ford Mustang. Chad graduated high school a year prior to his case taking place so that was in the year of 1989 and Chad had had plans to basically work as much as he could following his graduation in order for him to save up enough money to move to Colorado by himself where he planned on applying to colleges there and basically spending his free time snowboarding. And his case begins on May the 19th in the year of 1990, a day which had started off for him as working a shift in the local bike shop which was called The Village Peddler. This had only been his second shift working at the new job and at around 12.20pm he'd nipped home just to make himself some sandwiches for his lunch break. Both of his parents had been home when he had nipped home for his break but in particular his father John had seen him as he'd also been on his lunch break so he was at home when his son had come back. The Chad had told his father that he was making some lunch and then heading back to the bike shop as it had been a particularly busy day and he wanted to kind of do an extra shift while it was busy and before before leaving he'd asked if he could borrow $20 off of his father as he needed to fill his car up with petrol on the way. His father had happily given him the money and with that Chad drove off to work. Both his mother and father later noted that they noticed nothing strange or out of the ordinary with Chad when they'd seen him that day and his father had even said that he hadn't expected Chad to have planned to go out anywhere after his shift or be anywhere other than the bike shop as he didn't take any other belongings with him or he didn't even take a jacket with him. The following hour, Chad's parents, so their names were John and Dolly, they had needed to go into the nearby hardware store which just so happened to be just a few shops down from the bike shop where Chad was supposed to be working in. But as they pulled into the area, they noticed that Chad's car wasn't in the car park outside the shop. And this had struck them as strange as obviously his car is noticeable and he was supposed to be doing an extra shift in the shop. So they decided to head into the bike shop just to see if everything was okay, see if he was there. But none of the employees in the shop had seen him or knew where he was. Chad's parents had been concerned immediately but they just hoped that there was some sort of explanation as to why he wasn't where he said he would be and so they'd headed home and waited for their son to just turn up. But when he didn't return home later that night they decided to officially report him as a missing person. There would be no sign of Chad for the following couple days. That was until May the 21st of that year, just two days after he hadn't turned up for his afternoon shift at work. On this day, Chad's parents had received a phone call telling them that their son had been located, but sadly he was found deceased and in Chicago. In the early hours of the morning, a worker had walked into a garage in a housing complex that was just reaching the end of its construction, um, and this had been in a place called Wentworth Gardens on the south side of Chicago. This area had a reputation for being particularly rough, but the maintenance worker hadn't really anticipated what he would have walked in and faced since it was located on an 
uninhabited housing complex. Inside the garage that this worker had walked into, he spotted a yellow 1968 Ford Mustang parked with the ignition running and inside were the remains of Chad Mora. It was believed that the car had been left on virtually all night as there was no petrol in the tank and the battery was nearly dead and Chad Mora's death was initially ruled as a suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning. After learning of their son's death, Chad's parents were heartbroken but one question in particular had remained in their minds. Why was he in Chicago? From Madison, it was around a two and a half hour journey straight to Chicago and the fact that he'd been found in a particular unsafe and rough area of Chicago, it just seemed really strange to them. Despite Chad's family's concerns, the death had seemed to the authorities at the time like a suicide, but the family's concerns just grew even more when they were allowed to see his remains. Authorities in Chicago had transported Chad's remains to Madison in order for his family to host the funeral, during which they decided that they would have an open casket. And when they had finally found themselves coming face to face with Chad during the ceremony, they noticed that he had an extreme extremely unusual amount of bruises and marks on his face and on the, all the visible areas of his body. And specifically, they also noticed that the skin on his knuckles was virtually all gone. And unless some strange and concerning incident had happened during the transportation prior to the funeral, it seemed like Chad had been in a brutal fight. The funeral director responsible for the funeral prep had shown Chad's parents the clothes that he was found wearing and transported to them in, and his t-shirt had been absolutely covered in blood and what seemed to be drag marks all along his trousers. John and Dolly had been so doubtful of the suicide ruling at this point and they'd alerted the local authorities saying how much concern they had had. After being informed of the extent of the injuries displayed on Chad's body, the authorities had agreed that this didn't match with the initial proposed scenario of a suicide whatsoever and they asked if the pair could do all they could in order to delay the burial of their son in order for the case to be re-examined. And the authorities involved in this part of the investigation had been the day County Sheriff's Department and they'd gotten into contact with Chicago PD who'd been the ones to initially report Chad's death in order to request that they'd send over any information they had so this included the initial case reports, the autopsy files and any crime scene photographs that they had. The Sheriff's Department were also in the process of organising a second examination of the remains as it just, they agreed with the parents, it just didn't all seem to add up. The investigators had shown the crime scene photographs to Chad's parents in order just to see if they were able to spot anything that may have been out of the ordinary and they did. One of the pair had noticed that there had been a jacket on the passenger seat next to Chad in one of the photographs which they both confirmed had not belonged to him and it was at this point that they recalled they specifically both took note of the fact that Chad hadn't left with a jacket when they'd last seen him that day and so the sheriff's department decided to continue up this lead. However when they'd gotten into contact with the Chicago police department regarding the whereabouts of the jacket that was in the crime scene photograph on the seat next to Chad they informed them that they wouldn't be able to send over the jacket as it had disappeared. In terms of the autopsy report, the investigators had noted something that's only seemed to support the initial doubts in relation to the suicide ruling. The level of carbon monoxide in his system had not been the expected amount in the proposed scenario of suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning. If he had been awake and conscious while in the car, they would have expected to have seen around 50%, maybe 60% carbon monoxide levels in his system. However, the report stated that he actually had a level of 74%, meaning that most likely he had been unconscious while inhaling the fumes. And so this finding just kind of raises more doubts and more questions as to what had happened to him. When the investigators had attempted to get into contact with Chad's friends and family in order to determine whether any of them were aware of why he might have ended up in Chicago or if something strange was going on in his life that maybe his parents weren't aware of, and one person's report in particular had seemed particularly interesting, and this was the report of Chad's boss. He told authorities that in the run-up to Chad's disappearance, he had acted in a way that gave him the feeling that he had been concerned about something or someone almost fearful. And because of all of these previously unrecognised factors in relation to his case, it ultimately led to the Chicago Police Department deciding to officially reopen Chad's case and his cause of death was altered from a suicide to undetermined. From this point on, the investigation had to rely on the information of the public, potentially those who knew Chad directly, for any leads that they could then follow up on. Investigators had received a number of reports that claimed that 
Chad had actually gotten himself involved in recreational drugs and this hadn't particularly been a huge surprise to his parents. Allegedly they had been aware of his marijuana use and that he had used it in the past in addition to other forms of illegal drugs but nothing particularly concerning to them or very often. And considering there had been no sign of any drugs found in his system during the autopsy report, it just didn't seem like an entirely relevant fact at the time. That was until a close friend of Chad's had told the authorities that Chad had once admitted to her that he had not only been using recreational drugs but he had been transporting drugs around the local area as well as paying for a drug dealer in the area to travel to Milwaukee on two separate occasions in order to transport drugs. And these claims couldn't necessarily be supported by any evidence but it did open up a new avenue for investigators to examine. And then a few years later when Chad's case had been featured on a local TV program, the authorities had received a tip from an anonymous caller that claimed he had knowledge of a drug deal occurring between Chad and some of his own neighbours in a building in the south side of Chicago that these individuals had actually then moved out of the area following this incident. When authorities followed up on this tip, they actually discovered that three previous residents of this specific Chicago apartment building had actually moved to Madison, which is obviously the area that Chad lived in, in the weeks leading up to Chad's death. This begs the question of whether the claims of a potential drug deal having occurred are accurate. It has been speculated that since these individuals had moved to the area of Madison prior to Chad's death, he may have gotten himself involved with them and potentially been asked if he could transport drugs to Chicago or have been involved with some sort of drug deal that had happened and that may have provided an explanation as to why he was found in Chicago. And the conditions that he was found in following his death may be explained by a potential drug deal having gone wrong if this was at all possible. But like I said, this is just one potential scenario that has been suggested and there really isn't a lot of evidence to support these claims um, that authorities could track down anyway. It's just relied on a lot of hearsay and a lot of stories and accounts that have been provided from Chad's friends or people that knew him or local people it's all sort of up in the air but it seems to be one of the only sort of solid leads that they could go down. And what exactly happened to Chad Mora still remains unknown to this day and to my knowledge um, his cause of death is still listed as undetermined. But that is everything that I have to cover today. I just thought this was a really really interesting case because a lot of it just seems so shady to me. I don't know whether the drug deal scenario is accurate in any sense. Um, there are so many other potential scenarios you could come up with, none really with any solid evidence, but it does seem clear that the suicide ruling was initially a mistake and there is something more at play here. It doesn't just happen that all of these scratch marks and bruises and bare knuckles be found um, on someone's remains if something hadn't happened to them. So I'd definitely love to hear your guys' thoughts down below. But thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this interesting. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comment section and I will see you guys very soon for another video. Thanks for watching. Bye.